So as there, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank USIP and all the partners. It's been a pleasure working collaboratively. So as everybody is coming, I'm going to introduce my colleague, John Terman. But this morning we heard from the policy and international community, and it was encouraging to hear the interest and support. But the reality is that we can't judge ourselves and over-congratulate ourselves for work done here. Because at the end of the day, our constituency are the women on the ground. And I think Abby's film shows that. Visaka's comments show that. And this panel in particular brings you the voices from the field of people who are implementing this resolution in civil society in their own context. So, and John is going to introduce you, but it's really my honor and my privilege to introduce you to my colleague and co-author of this project and co-director of this project that produced this report, What the Women Say. Dr. John Tierman, he's currently the executive director of the Center for International Studies at MIT. I met him over a decade ago. I was a program officer for something called the Forum on Early Warning and Early Response, which was, I think, the first international network for conflict prevention efforts. And we went to John. He was the director of the Winston Foundation for funding. And he took a gamble, and he supported our work. And I realized that I was dealing with somebody who had a vision and really believed in partnership between the donor community and the philanthropy community and the NGO community. And when I came to the States, he actually helped us find office space here for what is now Institute for Inclusive Security. But he moved on to MIT. He was at the Social Science Research Council, and he went on to MIT in 2004. And I have, as I say, he's currently the co-director of the project that we did, but he's also the chair of ICANN. He's been a great mentor to me over the years and through this project. And most importantly, he's a very, very good friend, and I hope you enjoy the panel with him. Thank you. Everything I know about this topic I've learned from Sanam and the people on this panel, among others who participated with us in this study. And I see that most of the copies of this have been taken, which is a good sign. But if you want a copy, you don't have one, or you want to send a copy to someone, this is on the MIT website, Center for International Studies. Not hard to find. If you have trouble finding it, please get in touch with me, and I'll send you the link. But it's the Center for International Studies at MIT. Thank you to USIP for organizing this, and thank all of you and the parade of impressive people and government officials. I wish there had been a little bit more attention today to the causes of war and the U.S. role in, for good or ill, in armed violence around the world, which, after all, does have its consequences for women and other people. But in the spirit of lighting a candle, rather than just cursing the darkness, we have with us an extraordinary group of women who work on the ground in dangerous places, still dangerous places, and have been leaders in their communities, in their countries, and now internationally. And we are going to, we're going to have a conversation, which I hope we'll have time for you to join near the end of our hour, about, specifically about 1325, which is what's been on our mind as we did this study and as we've been holding events in New York and now here in Washington, about how to make real a U.N. Security Council resolution that the member states so far have not found, seen fit to make real themselves, why some U.N. Security Council resolutions are enforced and others are not would be a good topic for somebody's dissertation out there. We won't quite take it up in that context today, but certainly the importance of 1325 to these women's work has been extraordinary. And they're going to describe, to some extent, how, just precisely how it has been so. First question I'd like to pose, and I'll 
give this to my colleague Saru Garlo. I'm not going to in, I'm going to introduce the women. You can see in the program who they are. I'm not going to take the time to introduce them. Their, their bios are in the in the programs you have, uh, but they're uh, you know you can see the e- exceptional work that they have done in their home countries. And so I'm going to start with Saru Garlo, who has worked with us uh, on this report. She has uh, been a leader in Liberia. Um, Saru, we have been talking about women's peace building and security work. What, what does that exactly mean um, in the context of the work you do? What is peace building uh, and women's peace building specifically as you have undertaken it with your, your colleagues in, in Liberia? Thank you, John. Before I answer your question, I will also like to ask a question I always ask myself and other people. Why do we as women always have to justify our inclusion into processes? Is it that we are made by a different God? I just wonder if we just evacuate all the women just for five seconds from the face of the earth and see what will happen to all men. It's just a question I ask, and I go back to what John said. For, for the work that I do in Liberia, we try to create a space for ordinary women who are grassroots women in the villages to see how the voices can come to the table of policy maker. We bring them together to discuss issues around participation, around prevention, around conflict resolution. We are in post-conflict Liberia, and Liberia is extremely difficult right now because we have a lot of challenges. Our president is doing extremely well. She has high level of commitment. But the issues around everyday woman life, how do you connect these different international instruments, 1325, to make it more practicalized at the community level? How can a woman have access to clean drinking water in the village? How can a woman negotiate the issue of natural resources? It's one thing that is uh, 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 coming to fall in Liberia. We have a lot of resources. How can a woman sit at the table with the chiefs and the elders to negotiate the issue of land? She wants to make her farm. She wants to control the, the, the produce. When she sells the produce, she wants to control that income from her money. How can she control that? How can she have access to, 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 to service, uh, medical services? She has to walk when she's in labor. Maybe they have to throw her in the hammer and carry her three, four hours before she can see, see doctor. That, this is what we call peace building. This is what we call 1325. 1325 is not uh, buying it's not the U.S. government sending down corp security, private security to, 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 to security sector for our military. But 1325 is how can you connect that to the ordinary women on the ground to get them included into all the processes for the forces to be here. Thank you, Saru. Asafa Adam, you are the Secretary General of the Community Development Association in Sudan. Safa has been a Negotiator has been in party to negotiations in Sudan. Tell us what this peacemaking has meant to you in, in your conflict. Uh, thank you all. And I am very thrilled and uh, humbled to be here and to share my experience with you. Uh, I am, come from Darfur and one of the very few women as uh, civil society to have the chance to be in the negotiation table in the seven rounds of the Darfur peace process in Abuja. And currently, I am involving in the uh, Doha peace process, as you know, for Darfur. And it is the only leverage and evolving thing we can say currently going on at Doha, the participation of the civil society. Uh, Before that, I would like to say that uh, being in this uh, celebration of the 1325 from the UN for the last two uh, for the last week. I am a little bit. Uh, I have a comment, maybe a comment of all uh, other women as well. I I I felt as if there is a syndrome of forgottenness generally. These big guys, the international community, the UN, whenever there is a crisis, it is up 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 to the surface, like Darfur, 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 and suddenly they forget about, and then Congo, 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 or Afghanistan, Afghanistan. 
I, I, I am sure that it is the voice of all the women and all the people who are supporting 1325. It is our role and it is our mandate to support all women in the conflicting area with the same mandate. And we should not leave those behind. And it should be our mandate and our commitment in, 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 our, in their national, uh, national action plan. My experience is that the issue of engagement is instrumental in the peace process for the women. I am a, a humanitarian background providing assistance for the IDPs, the internal displaced uh, people, women and children who are the majority of the uh, camps. And we found that by only uh, providing humanitarian assistance, it is very important. Women looked as victims, only victims, and they are recipients and hopeless. While the negotiation going on in Abuja and other places, and the big deal between the guys is there. And also, it is not a matter of a number of women have the world or 50 percent, or this is an issue of, of uh, human rights that women are equal to men. But it is an issue of how women look different to the peace issues, look different to the perception of the security, wealth sharing, power sharing in the negotiation table. We have the chance using the Security Council re uh, resolution as an advocacy tool. We are not sure whether our government accepted or at least we put pressure on the UN to take us there. We were there and we managed to have discussion in the negotiation table with the negotiator, both the movement, the rebels of the Darfur, and the government side as the negotiator. When we set us our, our priorities, we found that the perception of security for the negotiator, both the government and the uh, movement, is moving troops from place to place. For the women, not moving troops. Security means that a woman or one woman can move from a village to a village without uh, anybody harming her, carrying her food basket, her daughter going to the school, her children can fetch some, some water. So we found difficulties. What does security mean? And that is we managed to put. Security means for the women there is no sexual violence. And moreover, we came to the issue of the gender-based violence. We found that the male even sometimes use the, the, the language using the uh, gender-based violence as a bargaining power. The, no, no, sexual-based violence, it is not, we can talk about the gender-based violence. We said no. Sexual-based violence, it is a spe specifically, it is a war crime. It is meant in a conflict situation, and that is, has to come in the peace deal. Finally, the issue of wealth sharing. The women are, uh, are from agricultural background, are uh, nomads. Uh, uh, wealth sharing it doesn't mean that to have oil or to reconstruction. Yes, this is uh, important. But it means to them they can have seeds, they can have uh, small uh, agricultural implements. We thought about there is a need for a women fund to support women. And w the going back, the IDPs, going back home, the issue of land, also it is meant to a women, they need to have a small a plot of land to cultivate in. So we just found that is there is different perspective. When we sat together, we developed that therefore women priority for peace and reconstructions, and it has been used between both, we managed to enter those into the Darfur uh, peace agreement in 2005, which is the most gender sensitive uh, agreement uh, in Africa, maybe in the world, despite of its fragility. And still, it is a case of success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I turn to Masrat Kadim from Pakistan. Um, tell us, uh, Masrat, how, how what is the what is the peace building work you do? Give us an example uh, of the work you do and how it relates to 
uh, 1325 and the themes we've engaged here. I am trying to actually do something in the context of prevention that relates uh, directly to 1325. Um, the, the area that I'm working is a federally administered tribal area and SWAT, which went through a lot last year. Uh, there was a military operation and of course there were the extremists who took control of that area. <coughs> I was working there before, during and after the conflict. Um, what we actually tried to deal with that the extremists who were already there, they were, they were, sent, they were taking up the and the youth. They were using those youth, youth as the suicidal uh, attackers, and uh, they were of course working with the with the youth. So to counter that, we took the women in the area into confidence. Uh, we built their capacity. We tried to sensitize them to the impact of this extremism on their own families and the community around them. We build these women peace groups. We don't call them peace groups. We call them tolana. Tolana means together. Um, and then through these mothers, we try to actually uh, connect with the boys who were under the influence of this extremist ideology. And now we are working with these boys. They are 75 in number. There are many, but the I mean, I have an access to these 75 boys who are under the influence of this extremist ideologies at different level of orientation. And I just feel that because of the mother, we got an access to these boys. And mothers and female, particularly women, can play a very effective and important role because uh, they, we have an access direct to the home, to the family, uh, through these mothers. And through, uh, through these boys, we can re literally address a very important issue that is of the radicalization and extremism, which is, uh, I think, challenging everybody, uh, the international community particularly. And it's a challenge for everyone uh, at different levels in Pakistan uh, as well. So I feel that women, if they are given the, the role, if they're, um, they're, they're given some empowerment that is political, economic, and social all, we can play a very effective and significant role in preventing uh, the chaos, the crisis, and the conflict. So I think it is at this stage that the international community should realize the role of women in preventing such sort of situations in countries like Pakistan or Afghanistan. Conflict prevention often talked about, not often uh, implemented, and, and that's a good example of how it can be done. Um, Lena Zadriga, you are from Uganda. You have been involved in women's work there at 1325 uh, for many years. Tell us, uh, what, what is 1325? How is it, how, what does it mean to activists on the ground? What is, it, what is achieved uh, through the resolution and related uh, resolutions of the UN? What does it mean to people there? Thank you so much, John. In the context of Uganda, UN Resolution 1325, without it, the Juba peace talks would not have been any accessible to the women of Uganda. I, as a war widow, had a personal journey in making sure that women were there in Juba during the time of negotiation. But the constitution of the negotiation team, the government team, and the LRA team did not have any single woman, except one from the LRA team, who actually was more symbolic than really a negotiator. So we challenged why there was no woman on the government negotiation team. Yet the, we had one of the most progressive constitutional provisions with respect to women's participation in rhetoric. We were informed by the, the leader then, Honorable uh, Dr. Hakana Rugunda, that you know the men on the team are because of the virtue of the offices they occupy. We took it by that word and decided to invoke UN Security Council Resolution 1325 to which the government of Uganda had made uh, commitments and decided to mobilize. We consulted with women from the grassroots. We also consulted internationally with the UNIFEM uh, Goodwill Ambassador from Kenya, we traced 
the women's peace torch to Diera Congo and made a very big peace caravan that traversed the whole of Uganda and we shook the government up to the highest level. We also shook the LRA team and at that moment they had no option than to accept women to go and deliver our protocol which provisions have been included in agenda item number <coughs> three and agenda, agenda item number five of the Juba Peace Agreement, although the final agreement has not been signed. But it was very progressive insofar as the parties agreed to implement the provisions of UN Resolution 1325 holistically. At the moment, the government has in place a three-year development plan, which it calls the Peace Recovery and Development Plan, to kick-start development and reconstruction in northern Uganda. It does not have a single provision about the provisions of UN Resolution 1325 and the inclusion of women's definition of reconstruction. What have we done? We have challenged this uh, peace and recovery uh, plan. We stayed it with the training from Inclusive Institute for Inclusive Security, advocacy training, and also trainings to make sure that we read documents and interpret them with a gender lens. So we had our evidence with which we used the media outreach. We made a very, very uh, significant different spaces and, and advocacy meetings to the extent that it became a political issue in Uganda. It became a, a very, very serious political is, issue in Uganda that the PRDP or the Peace Recovery and Development Plan was state, implementation was state. We have redefined reconstruction as holistically taking the experiences of we the women where the war was fought in our bodies to be part of the reconstruction. So that is the extent to which we use UN Resolution 1325. But, having said that, <laughs> very briefly, having said that, having used UN 1325 as a hammer and knocked everywhere, we are very sad, I am particularly saddened to have participated in that research and found out that the lack of knowledge about this powerful tool is very, very humble. <coughs> it's, it's, it's just too much for me to take. One of a high-ranking lawyer in Kampala did not know what 1325 was. In one of my interviews, I asked, do you know about you? What, what, what do you say about UN Resolution 1325? She's, he said, what? UN Resolution 1325? 1321? Is that the name of the latest gun? <laughs> So that lack of knowledge at that level, to me, is a very, very big challenge. And we need to make sure that we demystify UN Resolution 1325 from just being a document to breathing its life about massive awareness, about, like, the U women in northern Uganda have massive knowledge and they have even used local language in terms of calling it as Mon Kuch Kibedube. So to that extent, it is successful, but at the general level, the lack of knowledge is very, very serious concern to me. Thank you, Lena. Um, Turid smith Polfus also worked on our, our study with us. She uh, spent years in Palestine and Israel, and we had the benefit of her wisdom on that. Tell us, Turid, your experience there. Um, what was what was empowering, what was not empowering about 1325 in this very difficult and frustrating conflict? Well, the conflict between Israel and Palestine is one of the longest running in the world. And the women of Israel and the Palestinian women have, were actually some of the first to meet from both sides when it was still illegal. The PLO forbade Palestinians to have contact with Israeli citizens, and it was also forbidden for Israeli citizens, okay, to have contact with uh, sort of members of the PLO or so. But they met. They started meeting. And from 1989, they have, have had various forms of cooperation. 
Some of it informal, some of it very formal. They have done projects together, they have discussed, they have fought, they have cried in the same room. They, you know, some of them have been in prison, especially the Palestinians. Um, Israelis have been, Israeli women have been ridiculed in the press for, uh, you know, for, for sort of believing that, that the other side wants peace. When 1325 came along, some of these leading women that had had contact with each other for many years decided to establish an organization based on 1325 with support from the international community. And so the International Women's Commission for a Just and Sustainable Peace uh, built on 1325 was established uh, finally, formally, in 2005. So here you have a group of women that have worked together already for more than 10, 15 years. In 2005, we're talking. And they're discussing the difficult issues together. And you would think that the international community would be very happy. Oh, finally, we have someone we can work with. Well, I can tell you that in May this year, when I called all the international community's highest representatives in Jerusalem or who were assigned to Jerusalem from the UN, from the EU, from the US government, or actually from the Oval Office, um, <clears throat> and also the quartet's special representative. Now, we can also remember that they're all men, of course, but none of them had started to even think about implementing 1325. Mm -hmm. And they said to me, but, you know, we don't do women's projects. Why don't you contact UNIFEM and ask them what they are doing? And on this International Women's Commission, I also want to comment, since this has been up several times in this discussion today, there are women who are grassroots, work on the grassroots, there are women who are leading big organizations and have done for many, many years, you know, 10, 20. There are women who are elected to parliament. There is professors. There are people who have been, women who have been involved in negotiations before because at the Madrid talks, there were actually Palestinian women involved. So these are women with experience, they know international law, they know about human rights, they also have discussed among themselves what kind of a society they would like to see. And yet, nobody has even discussed with them or, <coughs> I'm sorry, invited them to participate at the table. And I think it's time that this happens. Thank you. Um, one, of the, one of the findings uh, in our report, and something that's going to be familiar to many of you, is that it's the violent actors that get invited to the peace table, and that the stakeholders, the peacemakers, uh, the community activists, many of whom, most of whom are women, are not invited to the negotiating table. This is a, an essential inequality uh, and uh, a foolish one at that, that we notice widely. Soraya Kumar, <laughs> Kumar Zan, I'm sorry, I can never pronounce your name, uh, who has been an activist, an extraordinary activist and leader in Aceh. Um, tell us um, what your experience has been there with this particular issue. What kind of, what, who was invited to the peace table at Aceh, and what were the consequences? Okay. Uh, thank you, John. I want to start with explain my, my feeling about what kind of peace for me, what the meaning of peace for me. For me, when, I, when Aceh already signed agreement, I, for me, it's already five years today, still like the key. I can go anywhere in Aceh, even with public bus at midnight. I can come here in very beautiful place and speak with you all here and go home 
with which no worry at all. But I want to explain with other women, how about the other women who live up to the hill? How about the other women who are live in the field, in the village, or who are ex combatants or who are the women who get raped during the conflict? I want to explain one experience of women who speak in the, our group, in the meeting, when we try to discuss women's survival, what the meaning of justice for them, what the meaning of peace for them. One woman who are 55 years old, come from North Sumatra, talked to us that in one day after peace agreement, there is meeting with Aceh uh, reconciliation uh, body, you know, provide some support for people who suffer during conflict. Most of people who meeting are men, and she stand up and asking the question, which way you will support people? What are mechanism? What kind of criteria? And then, suddenly, one man stand up and say that with very roots language in Aceh language, hey, women, this is our main business. Shut up, you man. And she said that, I'm so sad. I'm so angry. I'm, and then I feel it has really hurt my feeling. And then she don't want to shut up. And she said that, hey, remember, during the conflict situation, all of you who sit here run away from the Philips because of security issue. We are the women who sitting and stay in Philips, provide our children to go to school, try to get livelihood, support the other people who get raped, and then even negotiate with army because 14 of young men who get arrested. And then today, even I speak, asking the criteria why you know, women are too, too difficult to get support, and then you ask me to shut up. But it's no one single people who sit in the table, say something, and what she said just left behind. This is just so you an experience how too difficult for women, you know, to join a decision making if in peace negotiate, in peace negotiator is no single woman there. This is not because women have no experience. This is not because women don't know something. And not because women didn't get enough training and no knowledge about theory, about mediation. In 2000, in February, before declaration of 1325, we, 500 women come over from 23 sub-district Aceh, sitting together three days, and then in last day, we finished at 4 o'clock in the morning to discuss how to end the war after more than 20 years. We bring peace dialogue. We want to get dialogue, not send troops anymore in Aceh. And we got 22 recommendations, and including what really we want need in education for children, how about the law enforcement, how about health education, and whatever. And we went to our president, Abdurrahman Wahid, and bring the issue and talk to him, don't send troops anymore. But then, when we have formal negotiate, in hand silky, support with international community, no single women in the table. And this is not a surprise. No single point mentioned in the MOU. And what going on in another day after we get peace? The first time, you know, this is huge money come to Aceh. I can't remember from which country anymore, but there is. We get support from AU for DDR. And you can imagine, the first support, 3,000 egg combatants, all are men. There is women ex combatant. They mention quite often during the conflict to show world the war get support for women. They, they show the world, you know. This is women, Chinese women support to be independent. But when they get budget, they get money, they get everything, they forgot on women. Mm -hmm. And the second, we have the first 10 year martial law in Aceh. Three sub district women are suffered who are targeting a rape. Most of the, not, not most, all women who get raped are ethnic Aceh. 
and they are get raped for army, no single form combatant. Mm. But then, when they get support from BRA, <coughs> the criteria who lost family, who lost housing, who lost property, no mm. single mention about women get raped because women can't show evidence. Mm. So that's mean our government not recognize women who suffer, you know, with sexual violation. And then mm. the third biggest issue coming, which is when our government propose to use Sharia law to stop conflict. This is not at all what Chinese people are asking about, because they ask me about justice. But then when they propose implementing of Sharia law, no single people can say no, because they will see you are a bad Muslim. Mm. I was born as Muslim. I live in civil society, Muslim community. Indonesia, the first number, biggest number Muslim in the world. I have no problem with that at all. I, um, with my choice, I wear head cover. But one day, when the, the law comes and say you should have head cover, they will have another problem. Because not because you believe, not because you choose, but because this is law. Before, during the conflict, I get company from two peace brigades international almost one year half. But today, when peace agreement are designed, when I want to go out from my home, I should ask my husband first. What do you think my clothes? Mm -hmm. I'm okay. I will get problem with police Sharia. Mm. Because maybe some may hair come here. Or maybe my, you know, I use, I wear pen and then it's a bit tight. I will get problem. And my husband said that, just go. If there is problem, I will pick up you. I'm lucky. Because usually men will feel bad if the wife will get, you know, trouble. Mm. And because mm. the rules say men, the husband, who the one who have to take care, a good family, you know, something like that. But I'm lucky. So just the first is that issue. But now become more and more, more. Because just three months ago, yeah. there is new... Uh, 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 mayor made new degree. Women should wear pe- uh, skirt. We can't wear pen anymore. Our traditional clothes are pen, but no, there is new degree. This is because no one single woman sitting on the table and talk what exactly women need during the peace. Not you know like today what going on. And then there is another new law will become with death stoning if there is adultery. And parliament already passed. We come to our governor and tell him, don't sign, because it is so bad. And another, in this dead local regulation, there is one sentence say about rape, but they get punishment less than adultery. Adultery is dead stone, but rape, who doing you know, criminal and sexual harassment, sexual abuse, didn't get more Spanish. We are lucky our government not signed. But this is just explain to you how important women sit on the table to make sure mm-hmm. when we get peace, it is real peace, not just something else. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. Um, I want to leave enough time for some questions from the audience. So I just want to go around quickly. I'll start with you, Saru, about, and this is a question for all of you. Um, Here we are in Washington, D.C., the indispensable nation, um, as it's sometimes called. Um, And it is important uh, in a lot of ways and certainly can be important on the implementation uh, of 1325 and related um, uh, norms. Um, what in a minute, uh, if you can give me, <laughs> if you can give me one minute on what you would like to see the United States do, uh, both in its own action plan, but but let's not just keep it to the action plan. What is it the United States could do to help uh, implement and make real the promises of 1325 in Liberia and more generally? I think when it comes to the U.S. 
preparing the national action plan, right, as a question, right? What what I think they could do? I think they need to look at the the intervention strategy when it comes to intervening into conflict situation and have consultations with all the major stakeholders. I don't know the the, 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 the security policy says that you should go in first and bombard the area before you start negotiating. No, get the people involved into the conflict and sit with them and discuss. I think they need to look at the whole security strategy, the way they want to intervene to stop conflict. Because sometimes they think they're going in with good intention, but sometimes it escalates the conflict. And at the end of the at the, at the end, more women suffer because they are not part of the, 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 the negotiation. They are not consulted. And you know one thing, John, uh, I want to let people know that um, after the conflict, women, ordinary women at the community level are left to handle the trauma. They handle the, 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 the men that are coming back into the community that are deeply traumatized. They also have to handle themselves who are traumatized and help to rebuild the uh, family values and community structure that have been broken down. So I think if they want to develop a national action plan, and which is so funny to me here that the United States is developing a national action plan after Liberia, a small country like Liberia, who they gave all the support to. I think they need to look at the, the, the strategy of building peace and not escalating war. Yes, I think I would just say the same thing as Siru has just said. I think uh, the United States being the, the only superpower on Earth today, it has to look into the reality from a different angle and from a different lens now. What it is doing to Pakistan, all these drone attacks, if they stop those drone attacks in Pakistan, I think the situation on the ground will be totally different. They could create a lot of goodwill through all the development where they want to extend to Pakistan, but when it is added with the drone attacks and supplemented by the drone attacks, you cannot create goodwill. Uh, that's one of the things that I wanted to say from this forum. But at the same time, I think when there is a dialogue, when there is a strategy taking, I mean, or you are making a plan or a policy, you need to include different perspective, and especially women perspective is very, very important when it comes to policy making, policy implementing, and policy shaping. Soraya, what would you like to see the U.S. do in this action plan and more broadly? Okay. I already heard enough. U.S. made big, you know, play, you know, everywhere to make peace. So that means U.S. have very big power to, to make peace in the world. So the, the big issue is to make sure any single country U.S. play the role. Make sure there is a woman on the table. I don't know. They should get find a way to make sure. If not, just don't go. Make sure there is the criteria, yeah. Because then they will have a an, an new problem. They left country and there is new problem, especially for women. So first, make sure any single criteria there is woman on table and have space to speak to somebody here and make decision, and then don't let the impose conflict. Make sure women get enough support to play the role in the community. Sure. Yeah. Well, the norms around negotiations are not set in stone, and they're not really written anywhere or decided by anyone. It's, uh, it sort of happens as it goes, doesn't it? And it's a little bit different from place to place. And it's nowhere written that women should not be part of the negotiation team. It, that, it's also nowhere written that the generals who fought the war shall decide who sits on the table. So it's open, actually. And the United States, of course, as the only superpower, they are involved in so many of the conflicts that we have dealt with here and the solutions. They have a lot of leverage. So don't say that, no, we can't decide you know, who's going to be on the negotiating team. The countries have to decide themselves. Yes, of course, but you can, you can influence. You can add chairs. There is a lot we can do if we want to. Lena? Thank you so much. My um, proposal is in line with what we say in Uganda. When the U.S. sneezes, we catch the cold. 
That's true. That's true. That's true. So my humble appeal, my demand on behalf of the women of northern Uganda and on behalf of the women of Africa is in the process of developing this, this national action plan which is going to be a symbol of that cold that we are going to catch. Know that you are in the process of sneezing. Let this sneeze take into consideration that there are women out there in Africa who are going to be enormously affected by this national action plan. Put them in your contemplation as if they would be your grand grandchildren that we were, talk, we, were, we were informed about in 30 years time to come that this national action plan will stand the test of time from Africa to the United States. Uh, okay, uh, my message is uh, in this USA national action plan the vision, the vision should be holistic, not just uh, country specific. This is one thing, the commitment towards the all country in conflict situations. The other thing is that um, usually USA listen to the, uh, those who carry guns. This is a normal. It should also listen and see the prosperous and successful stories of women who make peace in the uh, ground. Finally, I would like to say, uh, including women in the negotiation for the special invoice of the special countries, they should have a specific strategy and uh, mandate of how to include women in the peace process and consult it with the real women on the ground. Uh, saying that because I myself, I participated in the peace process. I was in Doha. I met with the envoy office only here in USA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we'd like to ha entertain some questions if you have them or comments. Uh, we have about 12 minutes. Uh, I would just add one little note to that while you're going to the microphones um, uh, about what the U.S. can do, and that is... Um, uh, and hear me, federal employees, um, make it easier for these women and women like them around the world to get funds from the United States to do their work. The barriers to getting uh, USAID and other kinds of grants uh, are high. And I know that people work on that to make it easier, but it's still, um, it's still a very difficult, a very high barrier uh, for everyone, but it's particularly difficult if they're working in a second language or if they don't have good Internet access or they can't get to the embassy very easily and so on. So that is really, I think, uh, this $40 million, I think, of which a fraction is actually new money, could be a lot more, but, the, but I think even more important is to lower the barriers, the bureaucratic barriers, uh, for them to get the money. Okay, we'll go over here, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nita Evel from Congo Global Action. I just want to um, add one other thing about what the U.S. can do. One of the easiest ones that everybody can ask the U.S. to do is to ask the Congress to finally pass the Violence Against Women's Act that have been dying every year in the U.S. Congress that make it impossible for a, a, a person who's been um, criminalized as a, uh, using rape as a weapon of war to come to the U.S., and if it's here in the U.S., it could be trial in the court here. So that one we can ask to everybody. And the second um, uh, suggestion is the U.S., with all the power, everybody talked about how powerful the U.S. is, they can help Africa control the proliferation small of small arms. arms. Mm -hmm. That's the most important. That's mm -hmm. one thing that makes women's mm -hmm. life miserable in Africa. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I, I certainly... Any, any Reaction That's to that? Comment. Mm. Uh, That's comment. Good comment and, and small arms, uh, landmines, uh, the ICC, lots of things the United States could sign on to. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Ann Frisch. I represent Nonviolent Peace Force. We are a very young organization. We are a new paradigm 
in how to build peace from the ground up we go on invitation from deeply rooted groups and communities for their serious violence we are always on armed we are always nonpartisan we always protect and provide security for local people who already know how to do peace and human rights and just to tell you a little bit about Mindanao Philippines where there has been some outbreak of warfare our peacekeepers now numbering 88 internationals and local people were invited by both armed parties to be part of the monitoring team representing civilians so that is that's a real breakthrough and I think we need to develop this paradigm of civilian peacekeeping someone mentioned we should not assume that the the military guys get to make all the decisions about how things turn out and I think we're we're taking one small step there in Mindanao but let me add this our partners there have a thousand women monitoring human rights in Mindanao and just recently our partners announced a 30 woman peacekeeping team that will be working all around the Cotabato area where there's been so much conflict so just for everybody to know from these women and from the people of Mindanao it is working I'd like to ask our panelists if if there are similar efforts in your countries to to monitor peace agreements are women's groups involved and if so how or or where is the where's the need for it if not Lena what in the case of Uganda we have the follow-up to the Juba peace process which actually fundamentally is the peace the recover and development plan is being implemented by the office of the Prime Minister what we have also done is we put a lot of pressure and there was there has been established through the Uganda Human Rights Commission, the civil military relations uh, and centers, which are specifically in northern Uganda in, in the townships. And yet those services are needed more uh, in the communities, especially in the return process. So there is enormous need for that kind of partnership to ensure that uh, there is, uh, we, the, the, the communities have these centers, which are very, very critical because Northern Uganda, as we speak now, is still very highly militarized. Recently, I think three months ago, U.S. military went in the name of uh, some, some agreement and um, reliably informed they left a lot of ammunition deep in Kitgum. So we need the civil military monitoring centers. We do not really have them. So that's a very nice one to take on. Yes? Yes, over here, please. Good question. Who would like yeah. to address? I, I also would like for us to look at the issue of arm from both ways. Who's selling the arm? I do agree. We don't have one single factory in Liberia that produces 
arm. No way we cannot even produce single barrel shark, right? But who also uh, giving the authority to our leaders to buy the arms? People sell the arm. It's like most time people talk about uh, about prostitution. I always equate prostitution to market. You go to sell and come and buy. If the seller come with the arm and the buyers are not there, the arm will never be sold. So we also need to to pressurize our leaders not to spend our resources on buying arms. They have priorities. They have women issues, health, education. The money should be used to 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 build the capacity of the citizens. The money should be used for several other important things instead of buying arms. The people produce the arm. I agree. They produce the arm. They that they have a whole network to sell the arm. But they are also our leaders should not be using our resources to buy arm. So we look at it from both ways. <coughs> Excuse me. From our leaders and from the people who produce arm and sell arm. So you have to fight it from two fronts and not just fighting it from one front. Uh, just quickly, because we have one more question. Did you, did you have something? Okay. Just I would like to add that uh, we women also should not work alone just uh, to develop our agenda and criteria outside and try when the peace finished, we try to just endorse them. It is important also to work together with men. There are men who, friend to women, can listen uh, carefully and we can make use of them in the parliament, in, in the uh, UN, in whatever. For, uh, the issue of gender mainstreaming in our attitude of raising our agenda, it is important for how to bring women to the peace table or their issues. Yes, question over here. Yes, my name is Kelly McBride from the Carter Center, and um, I'd like to remind everyone of some history in our own hemisphere, which is the case of El Salvador in the early 90s. In 1993, there was a peace accord, and women actually were signatures on the side of the guerrillas. And the women were involved in, in sort of both sides of the conflict, but waging the war and also bringing the peace. And there's a number of women who are in elected positions in El Salvador ever since then as part of that peace process. And the women definitely had a say in the negotiations and the different points of it. So maybe it's a good example for other parts of Africa and Southeast Asia about what the women in El Salvador were able to do and what they're still able to do and what, in fact, women in Latin America are able to do. It has the highest level of political representation, elected and appointed leaders in the world. That's just a comment. Do, do, well, do, let me ask you a question, though, because I think this is relevant, and that is, do you think it made a difference to the peace in El Salvador that women were part of the peace process? I think it did make a, peace, a difference because it's a durable peace there, and there was actually recently a transition in where the, the guerrilla party was elected into government through peaceful elections. El Salvador has other issues, social disintegration, gang, other things, but women are, are front and center in that, in that country in, ma- in trying to make a change. And they became mobilized during the, the conflict, during the Civil War. So, yes, I think the fact that they were involved has, has made a difference because they're really leaders for all the other countries in, in the hemisphere who have gone through peace processes. For, like, example, in, so- in El- Colombia, they look a lot at what's going on in El Salvador and how they, how they came to their peace process. And in Guatemala, too, but Guatemala is not a successful peace process. Thank you. Saru, you have? It's, it's another thing to have women to the, at the peace table. In Liberia, women were now formally invited to the peace table. But what we did, we were outside while the negotiation was going on inside. And making sure that those women that were invited as observers in-house, we were giving our recommendations, our ideas, what mm-hmm. we wanted in our peace talk. We were giving it to them, they were taking it out there. And most of our recommendations came out in a peace talk. We didn't just stop there, what we did, because of the illiterate uh, population we have. We had to simplify the peace agreement. So we simplified the peace agreement, we took it to the villages and explained the whole peace agreement to the women. We had all women consultation and that, so that women could have the information at their fingertips. So when somebody is trying to breach the peace agreement, they can hold them accountable. So it's a whole process from negotiation to post-war reconstruction, all the activities women should get involved in, all of them, not just going to the peace table. Sometimes they just want women, the number of women. I normally say that when we go to training. They say we have 50 participants, 25 women. And so what? What are the issues that the women raise when they were having a discussion, a dialogue at a community level? The, women, the issues that the women raised were those issues 
considered into the final policy document are they being, being implement, implemented? So those are the steps we need to take when they piece their own world to rebuild in the country and see how we, in fact, we can have women into leadership. Because as I can always say, in Africa, if you have more women in decision making, in leadership, you get less corruption. Because women, if they are there, my age group, in Africa, you know, when you have men in leadership, they, you give them more money, you give them more room to marry more wives, and you get more corruption in government. But if you have women, women not thinking about marrying more husbands because you can't marry one. You can't marry more than one husband. So you focus on rebuilding your family and rebuilding the community and the society. Thank you so much. Let's thank these extraordinary women, peacemakers, peace builders. I'm glad we had a chance to hear from them. Thank you very much. I think that um, the last two panels, we've really focused on the human face of war. And I'm going to make a plug here for, for John's forthcoming book. It's called The Death of Others, and it's looking at civilian deaths in America's wars. And I think that that's part of, a, of the process of the U.S. action planning, to understand what impact we have in the conflicts that we engage in. So that's going to come up soon, and I hope you all buy it when it comes out and, um, and, uh, and support his work as well. Um, we're going to shift now to the next panel. Thank you for all staying here. It's been a long day. Um, thank you to our panelists now. Some of them are leaving to go fly home. In fact, Soraya is going back to Acha tonight. Um, and uh, I think have a stretch break and come back for the last looking forward session. Thank you. <laughs>